You're listening to the Armchair GM Sports Network. This is Rod Mahood, your in-game voice of the Niagara Ice Dogs, and you're listening to the Dog Pound Podcast on the Armchair GM Sports Network, your podcast source for all game analysis, team interviews, and up-to-date news regarding the Niagara Ice Dogs. Perlini! Overtime! Ice Dogs win! They score! Score! Hosang! First goal as an ice dog. Strom stops Shipley. Richie scores! He gets it to a kill. Thomas. Thomas has the angle coming in. He scores! Welcome into another special edition episode of the Dog Pound Podcast, the official podcast of your Niagara Ice Dogs, right here on the Armchair GM Sports Network. This is our November monthly wrap-up show. Look forward to getting you guys some great segments on today's show as well as recapping the month of November plus one game for the Niagara Ice Dogs here in their second full month of the 24-25 OHL season. Brandon Caputo joined alongside Cam Halbert. Thank you to everybody that's tuned in today on YouTube. Make sure to hit like, hit subscribe, and smash that bell to stay updated, up to date with all of our Ice Dogs coverage that get released here on the YouTube channel. And thank you to those listening on your favorite on-demand audio platform as well. If you guys didn't know, we, we record a live post-game show after every Ice Dogs home game live from the Meridian Center with Ice Dogs head coach Ben Boudreaux's post-game analysis and as well as a player. So if you guys want to stay up to date with more Ice Dogs coverage, those are available for you as well every single Ice Dogs home game. So with that said, Cam, as far as today's episode, we are going to hear from Ice Dogs Captain Kevin He on Kevin, Captain Kev's flight deck. We'll also hear from Ice Dogs Director of Scouting Adam Henrich on our newest What's on the Menu segment. Uh, look forward to talking to him as well. We'll talk about the Ice Dogs' recent stretch of games who, who've who kind of impressed us uh, for the month of November and uh, look ahead to a very busy road schedule for the month of December. But right now, the Ice Dogs currently sitting fourth place in the Eastern Conference. A down month as far as uh, what they saw in October with a 10-3 and record, but still in fourth place in the conference and uh, just plugging away here. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's tough to look at it uh, subjectively in terms of, you know, expectations. And uh, I think that we expected coming into the season that they would be a playoff team, but probably more on the borderline of being a playoff team. And uh, it's tough because that that's such a good start to the season in uh, in November in October that now your the the expectations change a little bit um or at least ours did just because of you know out of you know what, what was going on they were just winning so the more you win the more you expect to win however obviously november was met with a lot more challenge for the ice dogs they're really getting into the you know the meat of the season and you're starting to see uh the struggles a little bit and they're, they're having to deal with some adversity especially over the last few games um, but you still have to be happy with the fact that, you know, they're two points out of leading the division and they're three points out of being first in the conference. So you can't view that as anything other than a major success so far. Um, but obviously again, uh, like you mentioned, they're on a bit of a downturn lately and you know, you want to see that, uh, kind of improve, uh, going forward. Yeah. And if you look at the, the schedule there, as far as what they were able to do in November, they went five, six and one, I believe, uh, with the game against Peterborough there. Uh, five, six, and two. Sorry, with the game with Peterborough, so they went on a streak where they would put together a win, then lost. They they got two wins back to back against Sarnia and Brantford, but then they did lose their first back to back games of the season against Guelph and Brantford uh, the following week, and then they just kind of went on this streak where they win, lose, win, lose, and then they pick up a point against the Peets and as well against Brampton. So they're still being able to pick up points right now. But when you started off October ten and three, you knew at some point, um, you know, that this team, uh, we were pleased with how they were playing. But you figured at some point they would kind of hit a bump in the road, and I think that's what they've kind of had to do in, in November here. And 
They've had some games that have been more challenging than others, ones they want to forget, like that Flint game last weekend where that was you know, one of, one of their worst efforts of the season. But yeah. then you've got games like Guelph and, and Sault Ste. Marie and those other games where you know, they may not have looked their best, but they're still able to come away with one or two points. So if you're looking at it overall, like fourth place in the conference right now, and again with all those expectations at the beginning of the year when they beat Brampton in their home opener and they were on the CHL top 10 rankings for the first four weeks of the season, now I think like garnering your expectation for this team and still knowing that they're a very young team and, and they've got a lot of stuff that they're still working through and, and some injuries up front as well, I think um, you kind of put that all into perspective and say that, um, you know, that they're still – some things they got to clean up, but there's positives as well in that. No, I mean, like I said, I think that the expectation of the team was uh, to just be far better than they were the last few years. And they've, they've absolutely destroyed that. I mean, they're two wins away from matching their win total of last season. And, you know, we're, we're not even at Christmas yet. So um, you can't take that away from them. I think that the issue with the last two games specifically is that there were some really bad habits in the sense of maybe taking your opponent a little too lightly. And I think that comes with trying to learn how to win. Uh, we've talked about that on a ton of the, the game recaps as, as well over the course of the season that when you have a team that has a, you know, a lot of players on it, that just haven't won a lot of games um, in the OHL over the last few years, because the ice dogs were, were going through a bit of a rebuild. Um, you know, it's, you have to learn the habits of how to lock down a game and, and how to not play down to your opponent. Um, you know, the, the, the Flint game specifically was just absolutely infuriating to watch because we know that the team is so much better than the effort than what happened going into it. And it just, it really looked like the team saw Flint and, and went with, Oh, this is a cookie game and everyone's going to get their cookies. And, uh, unfortunately that's not what happened. And then you think, okay, you know, uh, the coaching staff's going to make sure that, you know, that, that, you know, gets righted real quick. And then you have a game against the, you know, the worst team in the OHL this season in Peterborough, who only have two wins total. And you get a big, I believe it was three, one lead. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you blow that, you know, that's a game that you not only can you not lose, um, but you had a lead. It's not like you had some extenuating circumstances, whether it be some rough goals that went in and you're battling back. It was like you had a lead against the worst team in the OHL and you couldn't close it out. It's just kind of inexcusable in that sense. And then obviously all the emotion around that game, you knew that Peterborough was going to give them everything. Um, obviously with, with Gavin's you know first game against the ice dogs again, and the way that it ended with Gavin getting the overtime winner, obviously uh, I'm super happy for him, you know, but if you're one of the overagers, let's say that, you know, you're the reason why that Gavin wasn't there uh, this season because of how the success they've had so far, you got to go all out, you know, and I would love to see them close out that game. And they, they just, you know, gave Peterborough probably the win of the season, regardless of how the rest of the year goes. And something in that game that happened right before that OT winner, and that was an Owen Flores 2-on-0 sprawling save. And he's a guy that just all season long, 14 straight games in the net. Now Charlie Robertson's going to be back for them. Uh, you know, he's been backing up, and he, he got some action there in the third period of that Flint game just to get him some reps. But uh, for the Ice Dogs goaltender being able to, to, you know, run the gauntlet here, you know he wants to play as much as he can in his overage year to try to earn that pro contract. But you know he's going to need a break at some point, and they've got a lot of road games coming up. You have that that big northern road trip so they've been leaning on Owen Flores a lot and I'm interested to see going forward into December how Ben Boudreaux kind of goes about that and if Flores continues to give them the best chance to win maybe he doesn't even come out of the net well there's no three and three in that uh in that stretch right so uh, you know I think the one thing about having an overage goaltender is that body's a little bit more developed for the the rigors of the season um, not to mention they're going to get a nice break um, for the Christmas holidays. I believe they have a seven day window off. Right. So you're going to see Robertson in, in probably one, uh, at least one game. I don't know if he would get two. The, the real issue here is that you can't go into the break on a big, big losing streak. You know, and we've talked about that over the course of, 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 of many shows that, you know, in November, I said, as long as they go 500, they didn't quite go 500. And that was because of the injuries they had. Uh, Brady Wasslin was away uh, for Team Canada, you know, and uh, they battled through that, that, that point of the season. And, um, you know, if they, if they continue to go under 500, the risk that they run 
and this is something I'd love to hear from here, you know, what you have to think about this, but obviously the team is overperforming or not overperforming. They are far exceeding expectations from the start of the season. I mean, they, they were the first in the Eastern conference for a majority of the entire year up until about two weeks ago. Right. And so with that comes, okay, they're going to be, you know, that they're going to get a shot at, you know, doing, going on maybe a playoff run. And obviously you don't want to mortgage the future too early, right? Because you've got such great young players in Crete and Wasslin and things like that. But there becomes an awkward conversation right around this time because once the deadline hits, which I believe is January 6th. Around there, yep. It's right around there. If the Ice Dogs, uh, this is what I would like to hear from you. What do you do with Loshko and Van Vliet? Because while, yes, we will more than likely make the playoffs because it looks like Peterborough is, again, their start was just so hard to overcome. They've been playing great hockey, though. They're in a lot of games, so it's not like they're a complete pushover. And they just beat the Ice Dogs, who were, again, leading the division. And they beat um, Saginaw North Bay. And they, Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> uh, But I don't expect them to go two wins in 15 games anymore, no. right? But that being said, they're prob- they probably played themselves out of a playoff spot. And North Bay kind of looks like they are showing what we kind of expected them. They went in two years in a row. And when that happens in the OHL for, you know, for a lot of teams that aren't London, you end up with, you know, a lengthy rebuild or a hard drop off, kind of like what Windsor went through. And now we're starting to see it with North Bay, even though they had a strong start. And then they're going to make some trades at the at the deadline to move away from, you know, uh, Lu- uh, Luca Romani, I believe, would be their would be uh, their number one player they'd probably move if yeah. memory serves. I'm trying to remember. It's been a bit since we've played North yeah, Bay. Anth- but- Anthony Romani. Anthony Romani. Why did I say Luca? Luca um, Pinelli, Anth- probably. Luca Pinelli, yes. <laughs> All okay. those Italian boys. Yes. Um, so they're probably going to move him, right? And um, with that being said, the Ice Dogs got a gift in Loshko. Do you move him because they're guaranteed a playoff? Not guaranteed. I, I would say it's a 90% certain that the Ice Dogs will probably make the playoffs, right? As long as they don't bottom out here. But if they do, you know, it's like... Next year is probably our window. If you know, if we're being honest, next year and the year following is really going to be our our last you know chance before they've got to kind of retool again. You got to get something back, I think, for Lashko. Or do you hold them for a, you know, the first playoff opportunity in five years? Because we've always just talked about just don't make any trades. But then you start to think of like, okay, we're not going to get anything for 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 Lashko, and I guarantee there's probably some teams that really want Flores. And and Van Vliet, you know, but you know, I don't know what would you what would you expect to see, you know, come the trade deadline if let's say they stay right around where they are, fourth in the conference. I think you already made your trade of your overager. I think you trade to Gavin Bryan already. You keep these other three on the team because if you think that you want to win a round in the playoffs, you need to have Owen Flores, Noah Van Vliet, and Andre Lashko on the team. And I think that's the main goal this year for the team is to get in the playoffs, get that one round of experience, and the next two years, and I know there, there's rumors about bit, the bit possible bidding for the 2027 Memorial Cup. We know Kitchener is going to be involved in that as well. Niagara could get in on that. So you want to make sure that you don't give up your good young assets for that 2027 mm-hmm. year in case that is going to be the year that you would want to host a, an event like that. You want to be competitive, unlike the last time where they tried to host it, but I think you stay put with those guys. I think you you really have a solid roster here of young players. You're going to get Asadorian back at, by, and Paris back, hopefully by the end of December is what we're hearing for both those players. Chanowski and Blake Aerosmith both should be fine. They were both banged up in the Peterborough game. So they we want to see what they can do with a healthy lineup with everybody kind of within where they should be in the lineup, that depth that they've kind of been missing with those injuries. Like the, to me, they have three solid lines that can score when everybody's in the lineup. So, and you've made that trade for Aerosmith as a younger player. You gave up two thirds to do that. I, I think that they're going to stay put here. I really don't expect a, a massive move for one of those guys like a Quentin Musty or a Jet Luchenko. Or those names that have kind of been floating around. I think those are moves you make the next two years, not this year. Keep that young core together. Don't you know mess with that. Don't mess with the team chemistry. You know in the room as well. Kevin and Lashko are the guys to lead you up front with those. Then those those next next guys to come up with Zada, Rubrik, and Waslin and Crete. 
to me, like, I, I don't want to see massive moves made uh, where multiple picks are going out the window and multiple players. Like, they need to remain competitive down the stretch to to make the playoffs, one, and to two, at least, you know, give them some experience of having one round or going to a game seven or, or maybe even getting to round two. That so like I don't I completely agree with not trading for Musty for example and 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 going in now I'm talking about you mentioned the Memorial Cup bid that would indicate that they're not really as much playing for this year but they're playing for the, those next two years trading Washco you're gonna get a second more than likely like impactful draft picks or even maybe O sevens or O eights right that would fit that that's what I was alluding to mm-hmm. like. Do you think that's a possibility? I personally would love to see them just kind of go, you know, about it. But the, again, the issue is, is that if you don't get assets for them, right, your draft pick is not going to be what it was the last couple of years. Your draft pick is not going to be a top four pick. So that player is more than likely not going to be heavily leaned on like Robrick and Wasselin have both been. So, you know, like that's just where I wonder if, you know, come the deadline, they don't move Lashko. And yes, yeah, I agree that they, you know they made the move uh, of Gavin Bryan, and maybe they could have just done that earlier if if that's the case. But again, we don't know. The season was so unexpected. I think from everyone that isn't Ben Boudreaux and and the players on that team, right? You know, again, I think just objectively looking at it, we just expected the playoffs, um, and I don't even expect it is might might be a bit of a stretch, just given how you know the history of the team has gone. But I'm curious to see what happens. You know, I don't know if I'd be upset. Um, because I'm again, I know how the cycle works in the OHL. It's so hard because you have such a small window for a lot of these teams. And I'm just very curious if they're right around fourth and they're not among the top, you know, the, the, it's going to be very difficult to beat Barry and Oshawa, in my opinion, and even mm-hmm. Kingston. Uh, you know, I think it's just going to be very difficult to beat one of them. Even within your division, Brampton could even get going, even though they're going to lose exactly. some guys for the World Brampton, Juniors. Number one team in the CHL coming into, in Canada and coming into the year, right? So, you know, maybe you win around because it's Sudbury, or it's probably Brampton, you know? And it's like, you know, that getting that playoff experience at least one round is huge. Getting people in the building, that's another thing. Like, that, you know, you get, the energy in the building has not been very high, and I understand why. You know, again, the last couple of years have been rough. But that being said, there's no way that the casual fan or just, like, locals that, you know, maybe don't pay attention to every game of the Ice Dogs, but when there's a playoff round, the, everyone pays attention, right? And that's huge for the team because once the casual fan realizes, hey, this team's in the playoffs, next season they're like, okay, this season's starting. This might be, you know, and I think that that'll kind of trickle down. But I, I just I don't know. I've wrestled with that that thought of of you know Lashko and Flores and and Van Vliet and what happens at the at the trade deadline because I don't I wouldn't want to touch any of the any of the O sevens but the overagers it's just you know it's it, I would be okay with either by the way with either decision they made I'm just curious as what management does because again like you mentioned they're they're gonna try for the Memorial Cup and they have a much higher chance this year than they did two years ago, or last year. You know, simply because the team will be competitive, you know. So um, anyways, interesting times. And this next road trip is probably going to determine what happens, I think, because if they do, if let's say they win, you know, seven of their next nine games. Right. I could see a situation where there's another Aerosmith type trade where they're not going all in, moving all of their picks, but they go and get some more help um, that, you know, is more of a perimeter player or maybe a maybe, a you know, an extra an extra forward. Um, but we also going to get Asadorian and, and, and Paris back, but maybe just insurance for them because, you know, they both dealt with injuries. So I look at it as if they're going to get talent back that can play, I'm all for it. If that's it's the what right I trade, think. yeah, because I don't want another situation happening where they trade away a, bu- a couple of guys and just get draft picks back. And then, you know, they're they're They have holes up and down the lineup that they need to fill when they're trying to be a, a decent playoff team. So if the right moves there, make it. But right now, like I'm pleased with the way the roster has been constructed. They've obviously have a goal with the way that the that they want to go about it uh, with, with West Consorti and the, the management staff, Ben Boudreaux and the coaching staff's done a good job of developing the young players and getting them to play to a certain identity. And when they play that team defense, they win. When they don't, they lose. And and he continues to make sure that he hones in on the, the style and the way that they're playing. And we've seen some mistakes, again, against Flint and Peterborough most recently with the defensive coverage. And, and that's, you know, concerning in that sense. But 
Um, we talk about things that need to, you know, that, that we need to see in December. The penalty kill needs to be a lot better. They're 16th in the, in the OHL in that the power play sitting around mid right now, but they've had a lot of opportunities as of late, uh, and just haven't been able to capitalize. So when you look at, uh, you know, those guys coming back from injury and you look at the specialty team specifically, I think that's one area where you say, if they have a good month of December, we'll kind of see where they're at, uh, come to come January. And if they're still, you know, if they're first in the central in, in, in January or they're fourth or fifth, maybe they do go out and get a player instead of making a move the other way, which we've seen the last couple of years, or if they, like you said, uh, move a player off the roster. But I think this month of December is really going to be the tall tale of, you know, make or break. They're going to be a team that is going to be a contender for a playoff spot, or if they're going to look to strategically sell at the deadline. What would you want them to do? I want them to stay put. I really do. Like, yeah, I, I I'm, think I'm, I'm actually on that as well. Like part of me wants them to make the hard move, like what they did with Gavin, you know, that, that was a, it's a very, very tough move, but that was simply because the team was doing so well. I don't know how you could argue, you know, uh, you know, obviously the, the human side of things are a little bit different from, but from the business side, but you know, I, I, I'm okay with them not trading anyone either, but part of me is just like, man, this isn't your year. Like I just, it would be a miracle. And then no matter what, you're going to go up against London with, what, 12 NHL drafted players? Like, no disrespect to Oshawa or Barry if they made it out of the East. But it, even those teams, it would be considered a miracle, much like last year when Oshawa, they were basically playing for whoever's going to get smoked by by London. And um, I, I just don't know, you know, if Niagara has the horses to even get through the couple rounds. You know, I, I again, I just think that even two games at home is so valuable to the franchise that regardless, and if they can get there with and get some big assets back, I agree with you that I don't want, I don't know if I want picks. And because the, the issue is, is when historically the last couple of years, when they've made trades involving picks, they've had to pay almost like a Niagara tax. Every time you see a trade, it's always us giving up more draft picks than what you see in other deals. Right. And, you know, that's obviously tough. But the, the crazy thing is, is that so far this year, they've won all those deals, even though the, the pundits and everyone we, we talked about you know, Blair Scott and Brody, like you do that deal a hundred percent again. But when you looked at it with the, the Tristan Bertucci and like a three-way deal, they did, it looked really heavily skewed to the other guys, either team. And I could, I would argue that the ice dogs probably won that trade. So, you know, but that's, it's harder to do that when you're always having to overpay for in, in a trade. Right. So I don't know. Um, I'm cool with it, with them, with them staying. But I, like I said, I think that because of their November, they've put this now on the, it would have never been an option. And now it's like, we might have to make some tough choices here. So, I don't know. And with the fan base thing and the attendance, I think once they start to see that this team has a chance at making the playoffs again and, and yeah. really earning the respect back of of the community because we saw with all the, the deep playoff runs that they had, the building was sold out. They had you know upwards of 5,000 fans, standing room only. The buzz around not just the city of St. Catharines, but the whole Niagara region when the Ice Dogs were in the playoffs. And right now when they're averaging you know, 25, 28, 2,900 fans, it's just not the same. And I think you know once I think the, the community will get behind this team once again with uh, you know the local communities and the mayors and everything like that. You know, really pushing to show that this team uh, is a competitive uh, program once again, earning back the trust of the fans who have been through you know some trials and tribulations the last three or four years uh, with, with this organization. So you can't really blame them in that sense. But um, it is a better you know product on the ice, and, and I think fans are going to start to see that and and want to uh, you know come out and support once again. Well, I'm just I was just doing the numbers and to see where were the where they're at right in terms of attendance and it's funny because the two years in which they combined for less than 30 wins right so the 11 win season which is, has got to be the worst in franchise history <laughs> 12 and 17 12 and 17 sorry and then 17 wins last year right yep they were seventh in the league in attendance yep right and this year we are 15th 14th and again that's you know it's crazy to me that like in not 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 two years ago, because prior to to uh, the pandemic and everything like that, the Ice Dogs had some fantastic teams, right? Jason Robertson highlighting it, right? Like they had some 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 fantastic teams. But you see how quick that, like, you know, some markets when there isn't when the team is you know having such rough seasons that, like, you know, you go to a game and it's a night out and it's great. And again, the the Meridian Center is so perfectly placed, like it is set up so well for anyone with a family or even if you don't have a family, right. And you, you know, you just you, to go out to a game with your buddies and then you immediately go out after for dinner before and, and afterward, like it's just such a perfect spot to have a great evening. 
And now you're seeing attendance in the 2000s when they're doing good. And it's it's frustrating. Um, as like, Again, I, I always talk about how I'm, I'm still a huge fan more than just someone who's trying to cover the team, right? And the Flint game specifically, like they just had no jam and the crowd had no jam. And it, it's it, the same thing was happening against uh, um, against Guelph the game before. Very quiet crowd. The team was 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 losing early in that game, and it wasn't until Max Creep fought where everyone got back into it, which again was a very veteran move by him. Just perfect thing, perfect touch by him. But I think that a playoff round at least gives the casual fan it, it puts it on the radar again, and hopefully we can get back to it because it's not like this team is perpetually in the lowest attendance in the league. It's not like what it was where there's like relocation talks or anything like that, or even Mississauga, for example, and even Brampton this year when they're again, they went into the season being one of the best teams in the country. Um, I, I hope that it's definitely possible to rebound rebound. And I hope it happens leading up to the playoffs too, because when the energy is going, you can see it on the ice, you know, when there's a buzz, but when it's silent and they get down by one, it's just, you know, it's tough, so. And I guess we'll we'll go over this before we hit the break. We we talk about the the the, the last bit of of games here. The last lineup I have up on the screen. You had Loshko, Waslin. I mean, Kevin He, Andre Loshko, your two NHL drafted players, and then they put Brady Waslin up there, and he had that two goals and one assist performance. And Peterborough really got him going. You have the Rubrik Zada Aerosmith line. You have Max Creek, Galliana of Levin. Hotless Ray Doherty, Asadorian Paris should be back sometime th- this month. And you look at the decors basically intact there uh, with Browdy, Virgilio, Van Vliet, Wysik, Scott, Chanowski. And then you've got DeWatcher and Frasca kind of rotating in and out. You've got your two goaltenders in Flores and Robertson. Like when you have all these guys back, like it, it just seems like it's going to be, you know, we'll see really what this team's 100% potential is that we really haven't seen through the first 20 or so games of the year. No, absolutely. I, I I completely agree. I mean, we haven't talked about it. Waslin is leading the league in points for rookies. He's a point per game player. I believe he's the fourth point per game player on the team. Mm-hmm. Memory serves Robert, Kevin, Loshko, um, and then Waslin. And Brody's right behind him, as and he's on defense, right? So, um, I think that you're you're bang on there. That once everyone starts to fall into place, uh, we saw earlier, like I, again that. My one question is, if Waslin moves up there, they don't have anyone that shoots right on the first line. And I know that obviously that can, you know, maybe it doesn't create issues because those three players are so talented, right? Um, but maybe that's the tr- one trade they make. They went and got Aerosmith, but I, I feel like he is more than likely going to be a middle six player when everyone is back and healthy. And Asadorian really throws a wrench in the works because Zada has been incredible. He's been a point-per-game player over the last 15 games. So... Now that he's humming along, does Acid Orange just fall right back into the second line center spot? I would guess he doesn't because of how Ben Boudreau has, has handled the lineup and when he rewards players that are that are playing really well at the top of the game, maybe eases the Acid Orange back in the lineup because it's two seasons in a row in which he's dealt with injury, significant injury. Um, and he's going to be a very important part of the team. I don't think that they even have a chance in the first round without him um, because you mentioned the 16th ranked penalty kill. Acid Orange's a He's a hound on the puck, no pun intended, right? So uh, he was a, he was a very good penalty killer. So you know we'll have to wait and see on that. But there's, I'm, just, it's frustrating because like I'm like yo, I'm so excited for next season, and this season it's we've hit this like we've hit the 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 long part of the season, right? Because that middle chunk, but the first month of the season's easy because it's new hockey's back. The ice dogs were first in the league. For a, for a time after being, you know, last in the entire country for three years, right? Like, that's unbelievable. And then you get to the longer stretches where it's like, let's get to the playoffs, you know? And it's like, <laughs> the players have got to feel that too. I know we've, I've listened to like, you know, some other uh, coverage of the OHL and you hear from players that like that month of February and January is pr- after the deadline is pretty tough just because, you know, it's so much hockey. You consider the NCAA plays like what, a third of the games, mm-hmm. right? So you know, well, uh, we'll wait and see how things play out here. But the, the, a lot of the lineup has performed so well, and um, like I said, though, a part of me is just like, let's let's get to next year because that's like the year, right? Which is obviously not fair to all the players this year because this season has been fantastic, and we're going to get a playoff berth. Yeah, you want to see Owen Flores uh, get that playoff Have run to, that he yeah, deserves. That one specifically, <laughs> Flores in a playoff game for sure, man. He is 
just been through it. Same for Kevin too. Mm -hmm. Kevin, you know, he was, it was a rookie in, in that season. I believe Flores was obviously a year, a year before that. Um, but they both came over during the same year. No. Yeah. Flores, Flores got traded Flores right was, before. Yeah. Right before the season started. So the last two years, Flores and, and Kevin have been, and Wysik has been, was injured for the majority of that first season, like almost the entire year. The last two he's seasons. The, yeah. He's the elder statesman, right? But Kevin and Flores have like legit been through it all for the last two years. So to see them in the playoffs, you know, Kevin, when Kevin's going to score in the playoffs, it's just, you know, dead set. Like it's going to be electric. And those two, yeah, it's that, that is one thing I'm really excited for. And the funny part is, is that Flores is probably the most competitive player on the team has the most energy in, in, in terms of fiery spirit, you know, and it's just going to be great to see that in the playoffs. Cause he is going to battle, you know, and he has the chance to steal a game, which he's, he's done regularly for the last few years. So, and he's always locked in too. Like he's always never takes a night off, right? Nope. Like it's so rare that we come on the recaps and go, man, Flores wants that back, you know? Yep. So, and so rubric leads the team right now with 36 points and 20, 20 and 26 quietly. Games. Kevin 33 and 24 Lashko 31 and 26. You talk about Ethan Zada being at 20 points in 26 games. We're going to hear from Adam Henrich a little bit later about Ethan Zada, but uh, you know, quickly what's one player that you've seen in the last month that in your opinion, like we talk about the big guns and things like that, but uh, who's really catching your eye as one of those uh, players that, you know, maybe be flying under the radar a bit. Well, we went through a long stretch where Mason Ray was like, continue to the guy where I'm like, man, he looked noticeable. Right. And he talked about it when we interviewed him the one time after a game where, you know, he's so big and the end of last season, it kind of reminded me of, of Dylan Rubrick where he was just so big, but he didn't use his body as much as you'd like, just because he's so huge, right? Like you could do some damage. Right. And I think this season he talked about how he was learning how to do that. And you saw, you see quite a bit of that. He's finishing a lot of his checks. That Guelph game specifically, I talked about that. That was probably the most physical game of the year. And there wasn't any gigantic hits. It was just everyone was finishing their checks. Um, you know, and there was obviously the history of the, you know, Kevin suspension and, and all of that. And the, and the maybe some little bit of, of bad blood that was recent. But nonetheless, like Mason Ray has been, been a bright spot because where does he fit in when Asadori and Paris come back? Is he the fourth line center? And if that's the case, like that's great because we've seen over the last month, the big issue is that we don't have the issue, sorry, where last year where there wasn't enough forwards and they were literally playing three lines, right? We're still having that spot where, you know, um, we've got Dianov and, and Hotless who've actually been pretty impressive now. Like their first few games, it was a little rough, but I, I think that recently they've kind of looked like you know, your typical OHLer, you know, and again, maybe their ceiling isn't as high, but they didn't look out of place, right? But they're only getting very sparing minutes. It's like the fourth line wasn't even really being used still. When Mason goes down, if he goes down to the fourth line, right, and Paris pushes, you know, Levin and and Blake down a, a, a line, and you've got Galianov and, you know, Zada's on the third line. If he's the third line center, Asadorian, like it just makes everyone be able to perform better. Cause if you give Mason a chance to go Mason Ray, a chance to go up against another team's fourth line, I'll take that, you know, over any team that isn't, you know, London or I guess Barry's pretty, pretty deep in, in terms of that. But like, you know what I mean? I'll give, I'll give, I'll give him the, the edge in that. So, you know, he has been, he's been really surprising. And Zada, we, we talked about how Zada's the X factor of the year, right? Obviously we knew that Waslam was going to be good. He was touted as such, and he has performed perfectly. Everyone was surprised that he fell to four leading the league in rookie scoring, right, on the worst team last year, right? So it's not like this team was the best team in the league and he came into a great spot, right? This is like, you know, uh, he's and he's doing it all, right? And and then you have Robrick and Kevin, who were obviously going expected to be point-per-game players, right, which they are doing, right? But then Zada was like, man, he, he got a little bit better, um, in terms of off the puck, but it was all it was with the puck. We wanted to see more offense. And if he could become that 50 point player, man, the ice dogs are going to do some damage. He's becoming that. And, uh, I, first of all, for him, I think now he's, I don't want to say a lock, but I would be surprised more than not if he didn't get drafted, you know, and then that's huge for his confidence training camp going to next year. All of that. It's just a big trickle down effect. And I'm happy for him because he is, uh, 
he's been the you know second fiddle to to Ryan's all of his accolades and whatnot. But Zada's been fantastic, and I'm glad that he's now getting rewarded in terms of his offensive abilities. And uh, he's been great because he is the most physical of the forwards that have the ability to go put one in the net afterwards, right? And their chemistry has been something else this year. With so Rubrik much fun too. That yep. like that is fun to see when you see Zada and Robrick ripping around. Like it's just fun. Even even with Waslin too, when they were on the line for a little <laughs> bit there. Like you know, I mean, it's like the new guard, and it, it, it that is that is fun to see. For me, I, I want to give a quick shout out to to Matthew Virgilio. I think he's a guy that has come over from Sioux, and it took him a little bit of time to get find his footing. He scored a, a nice goal uh, the other night against Peterborough, a one-timer from the point, and if he can be that kind of power play quarterback, uh, we, we know what Brody can do, we know what Wysick can do, but if Virgilio can find that little extra bit of, of offensive ability, we know he's a solid defender in his own end, but I, I've liked what I've seen from number 48 lately, showing a little bit more bite as well, so uh, to me, he's a guy that flies under the radar as somebody that I've been noticing on more nights than not, and he's been a staple in the lineup, hasn't missed a game. Uh, he's been playing on the first pair, the second pair, the third pair, wherever they kind of need him to go, and he's a guy that plays penalty kill. He plays on the power play. So for me, Virgilio is a guy that has stood out this month. 100%. I, I We don't talk about the decor nearly enough, and a lot of that is because they just don't make many mistakes, you know? And um, I, Virgilio has been really good, like really noticeable. I think the, the one... The, the one like, uh, you know, Brody gets probably the most, you know, accolade just because he's been so offensive, right? And we haven't had that in a while. Obviously, Wysick has a flair for the offense as well. But, you know, the rest of the uh, of them, like even Blair Scott, I think that he's someone that we don't talk about a lot. And the physicality and the that he brings and his, um, you know, willingness to defend his teammates is, again, another element that I don't think we had last year. Um, and you, those don't show up on the score sheet, but like, that's something that again, like him and Van Vliet, they do so well. And it's very important as we get into the, the, the more important games as the season goes along to have players like that. So I, I'm, I, I like your, your call for Gilio because especially recently he's mm -hmm. been, he's been really using his body the last few games. Yeah, absolutely. He's up to 14 points in the 26 games, three goals since coming over from the Sioux Greyhounds. But with that said, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back. We're going to give away our tickets for this month uh, with our monthly ticket giveaway on the show. As well, we're going to hear from Ice Dogs Captain Kevin He and Ice Dogs Director of Scouting Adam Henrich about uh, this upcoming draft class. So stay right here. We're right back on the Dog Pound Podcast, the official podcast of your Niagara Ice Dogs. Proudly brought to you by Global Pet Foods, where pets are undeniably part of the family. Back after this. Pets bring immense joy to our homes, becoming an integral part of our families. But this living, loving experience often requires a little extra care and attention. That's where Global Pet Foods comes in, with owners and staff ready to support you every step of the way. Check out one of their locations today, 3643 Portage Road in Niagara Falls, 160 Highway 20 in Font Hill, or 400 Scott Street and 344 Glendale Avenue in St. Catharines. Global Pet Foods, where pets are undeniably part of the family. Proud show sponsor of the Dog Pound Podcast, the official podcast of the Niagara Ice Dogs. Wild Bill's Auto Repair is your local center for auto maintenance and repair in the Niagara region. Since 2012, Wild Bill's Auto Repair and Body Shop has been helping customers stay safe and confident on the road, knowing their vehicle is in top running condition through the garage's services. Located at 7868 Oakwood Drive in Niagara Falls, the garage started as a tribute to the owner's father, William Robert Hunter, who passed away, continuing the same community spirit and high level of service which customers can expect from him back at Hunter's Auto Repair. Their multi award-winning auto shop has earned the trust of the Niagara community with its fair treatment of all customers who can feel confident they'll get trustworthy advice and repairs during their visit. Their experienced crew loves meeting new people and looks forward to forming a lasting partnership for the care of your vehicles. To find out more or to book a service, contact them today at 905-358-7868 or wildbillsauto.ca. Wild Bills Auto Repair, helping customers stay safe and confident on the road since 2012. Collie's Original Sports Bar is your ultimate destination for unbeatable food, drinks, and sports action in Niagara. Whether you're gearing up for a big game, winding down after a day at the office, or just looking for a lively spot to catch up with friends, Collie's has you covered. Their menu is packed with mouth-watering options, from classic pub favorites to unique chef specials, all served alongside a wide selection of craft beers, cocktails, and daily drink deals. With multiple TVs broadcasting the latest sports events, you won't miss a minute of the action. 
anytime, no matter where you sit. Cully's Original Sports Bar, a proud supporter of Niagara Ice Dog Hockey. Whether you're gearing up for the game or celebrating the big win, Cully's is the place to be before and after every Ice Dogs matchup. Check out their menu online at cullys.com. Give them a call at 905-684-1771 or check them out on Facebook, X, or Instagram for more information. Located at 223 St. Paul Street in the heart of downtown St. Catharines, just minutes from the Meridian Center. Open daily Sunday to Thursday till midnight and Friday to Saturday till 2 a.m. for those late night eaters. Cully's, it happens here. Fuel up your day with Gales Gas Bars. They're your go-to gas stations in the Niagara region. Remember, at Gales, they're not just a gas station. They're a local tradition. Whether you're hitting the road or staying cozy at home, choose Gales. Gales Gas Bars provide reliable fuel that keeps you moving. Stop in for quality you can trust and service with a smile. Don't settle for less. Head to Gales Gas Bars today. Because when it comes to fuel, you're going to Gales! Learn more at gales.ca. Are you an employer looking to hire? Let the Niagara Employment Help Center save you valuable time and money by making your hiring process easier. Their services include free job postings in-house and on our website. Fill job vacancies quickly and efficiently. Access to a bank of potential employees, reduce employment costs, and financial incentives may be available to offset the cost of new hire training. Check out their website at ehc.on.ca or call 905-358-0021 for more information. The Niagara Employment Help Center, helping people find work since 1983. This Employment Ontario program is funded by the Government of Ontario. This is Alex Asadorian. Hey, it's Ryan Roberg. This is Ivan Galianoff. This is Matthew Rajoy. My name is Jack Browdy. And this is the Dog Pound Podcast. The official podcast of the Niagara Ice Dogs. Welcome back to part two of today's Dog Pound Podcast monthly wrap-up episode for the month of November 2024. Brandon Caputo and Cam Howard are back with you. Thank you to everybody that's tuned in on the YouTube channel. Make sure to hit like, hit subscribe, and smash that bell. And thank you to those listening today on your favorite on-demand audio platform. The Dog Pound Podcast is proudly brought to you by Global Pet Foods, where pets are undeniably part of the family in all four of their great Niagara region locations. We're here going to discuss uh, Kevin He's comments uh, on our monthly captain segment with the uh, with Kevin He, the Winnipeg Jets fourth round prospect as well. We're going to hear from Ice Dogs director of scouting, Adam Henrich, for a check in on uh, his thoughts on this most recent draft class that has been producing so well uh, for the Niagara Ice Dogs. So with that said. Cam, first, uh, let, let's give away our tickets. So the code word for today is going to be hockey tape. So again, make sure to send us a DM on Twitter or Instagram and uh, tell us what the code word was, and you can win yourself some free Ice Dog tickets for this month to a select game. Captain Kev's Flight Deck, and as always, that is brought to you by Gales Gas, your go-to gas station in the Niagara region, or not just a gas station or a local tradition, because when it comes to fuel, you're going to Gales in multiple locations across Niagara. Let's hear what the Ice Dog's captain had to say about his performance and his team's performance in the month of November and going forward into a road-heavy December. Back on another edition of Captain Kev's Flight Deck, brought to you by Gales Gas with the captain of the Niagara Ice Dogs, Kevin He. Kev, thanks a lot for doing this. I, I know you guys are still plugging away at it here in December, but November, as far as a month for you guys, not as successful as you would have maybe liked to, when you started off October with 10-3 and three record, but 5-6-2 and two in the month of November. How would you kind of assess the team's play here uh, in the second month of the season? Yeah, uh, obviously, you know, we weren't as successful successful as you uh you just said mentioned earlier but um you know for us it's it's a new month now it's going into december uh, last month before the break so we're trying to turn the page and you know just focus on the, the new month ahead of us for you personally you had uh, nine goals and three assists in the 11 games i'm counting the the one game against peterborough on december 1st as well how, how do you feel like you you are out there you're up to 20 goals on the season now in only 24 games uh just how do you feel out there personally and, and getting adjusted to uh the role wearing the c as well yeah i felt like it you know it wasn't my best month i felt like i had a lot more to give but um I think with me, it's just, you know, same thing, like I said earlier with the team, is just turning the page and focusing on what's at hand now and, you know, looking on to the next week and the next month. So 
uh, for us, I guess, just turn the page. I don't mean to bring this up in a negative way, but do you almost use it as motivation when the World Junior roster came out yesterday and there was a lot of top-end players that uh, were left off of it, including yourself? Do you kind of just use that as motivation for the next time uh, an event like that rolls around for Hockey Canada that your name should be on that list? Yeah, absolutely. I just, you know, I just use that as motivation and just continue to try to improve my game, improve my play, and I'll do whatever it takes to help the team win. As far as uh, you got a newcomer this month, you brought in Blake Aerosmith from the London Knights. Uh, seems like he's got some chemistry with, with Rubrik and Zada there on the, on the second unit, and I know he was a little bit banged up in that game against Peterborough, but what can you tell us about the, the newest acquisition, Blake Aerosmith? I know he's more of a, a quiet guy, but uh, is there something that you, funny that you can tell Ice Dog fans about him so far? Yeah, I think all the boys really liked him right off the hop. I think he's been, you know, been able to fit in really smoothly with the boys and I thought he's been playing well especially you know like you said with the rubric and Zod, I thought he fit in really well over there and you know I'm very excited he has a lot of potential he's a great kid so I'm excited to see what's to come from a captain standpoint uh, who's somebody that impressed you this month with uh, you know their work on and off the ice to, to really try to improve in, in your mind uh, is there a name that that pops out to you that uh, you thought had a really good month I like Galley a lot I think um, he's been battling through all you know the whole month kind of up and down the lineup but um, I see him putting the work at day in and day out here. So I, you know, that's a kid I got a lot of respect for. And, uh, yeah, I think for him is just, you know, keep continuing his game and continue improving his game and, uh, just keep working at it. This month of December, uh, you guys got that, that big road trip, the Northern road trip coming up in North Bay, Sudbury and Sioux. It's going to be three games and four nights up there in the North. Uh, how much one are you looking forward to that as far as a team building standpoint? Because we know those, uh, those times on the road are always, uh, what you look back on after your career is done, but, uh, you know, looking forward to, to getting up there and, and a lot of road games this month as well in Barrie and Brampton. And then you come back from Christmas and you'll have Flint and Saginaw as well before finishing off December with that home game uh, on New Year's Eve against Peterborough. So what's the mindset when you go into a month with so many road games? Yeah, like you said, team building is a huge factor. I think uh, for us is you know, how tight we can get, especially like you said, we got a lot of road games coming up, a lot of away games. So uh, for us, you know, just resting our bodies, making sure you know, you're well fed, well recovered, get enough sleep. And, you know, it's obviously tough going on the road for, um, you know, a couple of days, but uh, we're trying to use it to the best we can and try to, you know, build on the team chemistry there. What can you say about your goaltender, Owen Flores? Started 14 straight games while Charlie Robertson's been on the shelf, and I know Charlie got in the third period of that uh, that game against Flint, but what can you say about your overage goaltender playing 14 straight games in the net? I know that's pretty much unheard of. He had a long stretch last season, but I know he wants to play in the net, so uh, what has it been like uh, playing in front of number 35 the last uh, stretch of the season here? Yeah, you know, when you see, you know, our goalie battling through like that, I mean, it's, you know, 14 games, like you said, it's no easy feat so when he's battling through and putting his body on the line you know day in and day out and you know especially every game for the last 14 I think you know you just want to do the best you can to help him and uh that's been a huge motivator for us you take a lot of pride in what you do on the ice and off the ice Kev and as far as you know what you guys are able to accomplish you and, and Lashko have good chemistry up there on the top line and then they've kind of been uh moving some guys around there as your your third line mate but what's the mindset as you guys go forward now and, and what's something you're really trying to one improve on as an individual and two hopefully uh to see some more positive team results this month as opposed to just playing some 500 hockey yeah, I think uh, just for our, especially our line, I think just trying to find the chemistry with the third guy. Um, like you said, there's been you know a couple guys up and down here and there, but uh, for us, just trying to build us, you know, build off that as much as we can going into this month. You know, uh, it's a huge month for us, and obviously, like you said, we want to play better as a line and we want to play better as a team. So. It's been a huge motivator for us. And lastly for you, Kev, I know we're not going to speak again on this segment until after Christmas. So what's something that uh, that Kevin, he wants uh, under his Christmas tree for, for Christmas? And second part to that, are you guys planning on doing any Secret Santa or anything uh, with the team Christmas uh, holidays or anything like that? Um, I think for us, it's just have a su- successful month. Uh, you know, um, We're not going to classify with wins or losses, but I think I want the group to really give, give their best effort here, and uh, especially going into the break. So I think that's something I want to see from the team and I want to see from myself. Just, you know, just keep working at it. I think that's probably the biggest thing I want to see from myself. Well, Kev, I, I know you keep it serious and you're dialed in, so uh, I I appreciate that uh, you're not even looking ahead. you got a lot, to, a lot of hockey to play here uh, but before you hit the break, so I appreciate you being honest with that and, and being uh, completely zoned in on what you guys need to do on a day-in and day-out basis. But uh, that's been another edition of Captain Kev's Flight Deck with Niagara Ice Dogs Captain Kevin E. Kev, thanks so much for doing this, and look forward to seeing what you guys are going to do in December, and happy holidays to your family as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Caputo. Happy holidays to you as well.
There was Ice Dogs Captain Kevin He on another Captain Kev's flight deck brought to you by Gales Gas. Cam, he said a lot of good things there. I liked when he talked about, uh, you know, wanting to see the team's best effort, talking about trying to find chemistry with that third guy on the line. A lot of a lot of good stuff there from Kevin He. I want to know your reaction to it. Well, I think that, like, something you mentioned, and specifically, like, playing in front of Flores. You know, we, we often just give, we talk so much about Flores because he battles and he's just always in the net. And very rarely is he the reason that there was a loss, right? And it's it's interesting to hear him from a teammate standpoint that, you know, they all pay attention to what he's doing, right? And I think that's fantastic. I also think that, you know, when it comes to the chemistry thing, a lot of it, they played so many games at home. And while that sounds great, right? But again, attendance hasn't been fantastic. So, you know, there's been a couple games. The Teddy Bear Toss game was so fun and, you know, felt like a playoff game. Uh, but that being said, I think that going on the road for this long stretch, that's when you see the team building because they're forced to just basically, you know, they're, they're all on the road. They're on the track. They travel together. And that's usually when you see kind of the chemistry really come out. So, you know, uh, I think that it's going to be super important for them to find that third line mate and, and just let it settle in because having a lot of pairs is great. But hockey is played with three three people on a line. Right. So. Um, you know, it's always, it's always great to hear from him. He, he's super professional already, super polished as like, just like a, uh, an athlete and as a man, you know, I, I think that, uh, the Winnipeg Jets made a heck of a pick. And I think that the rest of the league, uh, is really going to realize their mistake to let him fall to the fourth round of the Jets, uh, over the next rest of this season. And then into next. Absolutely. And they're going to need their best effort because they got two home games this week and then they bookend with a home game on uh, New Year's Eve, but they've got seven road games in between that. You've got the Northern trip. You've got the Michigan trip in there. So again, like you said, they're going to be around each other a lot on the road and, and they're going to need to to make sure that they're rested and, and be able to go out there with some positive results because it's going to be, it's going to be a long month uh, for them if they can't get this thing turned around here. These two games upcoming at home are against two very good opponents that have not had a good start to the season, but it cannot be taken lightly. And uh, it's going to be paramount that they win one of these to to kind of right the ship a little bit. Because again, Flint and, and Peterborough are both among the you know the lesser teams in the in their cycle right now, and uh, they did not play well enough in those two games. And now you've got to play two tough opponents um, that are going to give them a, a much bigger battle. Um, they're very capable of winning against these two teams. I just want to see the effort all the way through and not just rely on Flores bailing them out. So with that said, we're going to go to our final segment today. What's on the menu? Brought to you by Carmine's Pizza Italiano. You tried the rest, now it's time to try the best. Carmine's Pizza Italiano, proudly serving the Niagara community since 2013. Check them out at carminespizzeria.ca for the best quality pizza and wing combos anywhere in Niagara. Here is Ice Dog's Director of Scouting, Adam Henrich, on this most recent draft class, and as well, uh, updating us on the Whippy Silverstick Tournament that happened just this past weekend. Welcome back to another installment of What's on the Menu, brought to you by Carmine's Pizzeria Italiano, with the Niagara Ice Dogs Director of Scouting, Adam Henrich. Adam, thanks a lot for taking the time today. I know it was a, a busy week uh, weekend for you with the Whippy Silver Stick Tournament uh, and everything else you got going on with, uh, with the scouting class this year, but uh, thanks for coming on and uh, updating Ice Dog fans on uh, you know uh, the ins and outs uh, of what it's like as a, as a Director of Scouting. Thanks for having me, and yeah, it was definitely a, a busy but successful weekend. Seeing what what's out there going into uh, our our 2025 draft. So yeah, uh, before we get into the ice dogs portion of it, just uh, how cool are events like that for uh, for somebody in scouting to kind of get a good look at some of the the top end players available, and you know, not all the top players are there because there are some teams that just you know have one or two really standout players, and unfortunately, their teams uh, you know don't have the success to get there. But uh, what do tournaments like that kind of show you as far as uh, what's going to be available, and and do you take a lot of stock into if uh, players come out big from those tournaments? So. You know, to me, I, I still think it's a little preliminary, but it's not in a way. I mean, this is the term I think everyone's sort of analyzing and, you know, going over their list and being like, you know, who falls where. And, you know, after sort of the preseason Titans tournament, you know, you come into this one, you know, with a head of, okay, we're going to see, you know, where players sort of lie in the category. Um, you know, who's the real deal? You know, who can be added? You know, who can be dropped? Stuff like that. So, you know, there was a lot of hockey. We saw a lot of it. The one thing about the stage group is there's a lot of parity. I found it interesting. There was, there was teams who, you know, maybe came in as an eighth seed and, you know, went to the finals, just how many finals, right? So 
it shows there's a lot of good players, but you know, who's the guys who are going to step up and take themselves into that f- top five, top 10 range. Right. So, you know, I got a good idea. I've known it, but you know, this weekend showed me, you know, a lot of players and then the depth guys, you know, what are we going to see the goaltenders, <laughs> you know, the depth defensemen, the depth forwards, you know, players like that who could, you know, can be guys down the road who, you know, on the championship team can be your third line guys. Right. So, um, there was a lot, you know, we already started discussions last night, talking to one of the scouts today, and it was just like, wow, this kid, that, this kid, that, right? So it's an exciting time for, you know, the scouting staff, as well as just as the players, where this is sort of the start to, like I said, getting ready for the draft, right? I know you don't have much control over how many picks each organization has and things like that. And, and the ice dogs do have a, a good selection of draft picks, but when trades happen and teams go through cycles where they are missing a bunch of second, third, fourth round picks, and, and you're really just trying to, to pick best available. Does that kind of change anything from a scouting perspective or are you always just looking at a certain two or three tangibles that you're always going to be taking in players, no matter how many draft picks your organization has? So I think like there's a necessity or need for what you want in your lineup. And we go over that obviously with the management staff and then we know we're looking for a little more, but listen, you're always looking for the best player available. Right. And I think, or the best player at that position. I mean, you know, like, and I always say it, right. It's these kids are still developing, you know, they're still young you know, there might be a handful of kids who, okay, you know they're going to be in that top 10 or 20. And sometimes some teams have a player that's 40, and other teams have a player that's 100. That's how tight it is, right? So I think you got to really watch your player and know what you're looking for. you got to know what your team wants. Um, and then you have what you like. And I know what I like, and I know what our staff likes. And you can see the last two years what we built, you know, in terms of character and speed and, you know, like I said, tenacity willingness to, to, to get the puck, right? Our games, the pace is picked up, right? And you can sort of see that's the direction we keep heading, right? I mean, want the puck, good character, tons of speed, right? Getting some size in the back end. Um, so, you know, we're going to try to continue that and find those players, the diamonds in the rough, or the players that we see in front of us that can help improve the club as we go along. And honing in on uh, one of the you know players that you've known well over the years, and you've loved to see sort of his development, and that's uh, you know newly named captain Kevin He for the Ice Dogs. Been wearing the C for about a month now, and what you've seen from the cr- progression of Kevin He. I know you coached him uh, for a lot of years, um, you know, in minor hockey growing up, and and you've obviously had an eye on him on the as on the scouting side before Niagara was able to select him uh, in the second round. Just a you know, a few drafts ago, back in the 2022 uh, OHL draft, and I know he probably should have went a lot higher, but he he unfortunately had an injury in his draft year. But uh, what have you seen from the progression of Kevin He? 34 points in his first year, 53 points and 31 goals in his second year, and then now has just exploded with 20 goals in only 24 games, 33 points already. Uh, you know, a quarter way through the season. How one? How proud are you of Kevin He that he's been able to do this, and and what have you seen from his progression over the years, and and why you had such an eye on him you know uh, all those years ago so i've coached kevin over the, like when I, he was younger right for for about five years and, and I, one thing i know about him is he wants it bad right it, no matter what you know he is a mindset and his goal is to win to score goals to compete to get the puck and you can't stop him right and he does that with his head, head held high and he has a strong you know head on his shoulders He's a great leader. His character is so strong. He's a great kid. I mean, the way he plays, the environment he brings into a room is infectious. I see it, and I've seen it, right, even at this age. And I think with him, it was, like I said, always like no matter what happens, Kevin is going to make it and make things better for himself and for a team because of how bad he wants it. On top of it, you know, like we spoke about, I mean, he's so fast, right? You can't beat speed. I mean, this kid was, you know, breaking Connor McDavid's fastest lap record when he was 16 at, you know, at, at his at, at a combine, right? Like, so you mix and match all that with his NHL shot and his willingness to, you know, to win and score goals and compete, that's a tough thing to, to compete with, right? So, you know, I'm proud of him. I've seen him from layers from, like, you know, when he was playing – 10-year-old hockey at the brick, you know, right until, you know, draft the OHL, draft the NHL. His progression has been amazing, but, like, you know, he's carrying this team on his back, and hopefully we just keep going with it, right? He's going to have a nice little career ahead of him, and it'll be fun to watch. 
Absolutely. Looks like a definite fourth round steal uh, for the Winnipeg Jets. And it's been nice to see his progression over the last three years now as the, as the Ice Dogs, the captain and catalyst. But a couple other names that are, you know, flying under the radar a little bit that you obviously and your scouting staff have had a, a big part in recreating this young core for the Ice Dogs. Last year, you had two top five picks with Ryan Rubrick and Ethan Zada, and as well as Ivan Galianov in the fourth round, who uh, plays a, a solid role for this club as well. And then this year's draft with Brady Wasslin, fourth overall, Max Creed in the second round. You've also got you know a, a prospect goaltender in Matthew Humphreys waiting in the rings. Charlie Hotless is another guy uh, that's signed to the team right now. Uh, Nick Frasca, as well as a third rounder. So you've got like seven or eight really quality young players that you've taken in the last uh, last two OHL priority selection drafts. How pleased are you with, you know, the way that those guys have kind of developed into OHL players and why you think that, uh, you know, you had such an eye on them going in into this and, and why they're now uh, becoming part of this young core that the uh, Niagara Ice Dogs are building with the uh, and, and the coaching staff is really trying to develop here. Well, I think one thing you could take from all these players uh, we've drafted and in our lineup, and this is what our team is now, it's exciting, right? Everyone is exciting in their own way. So Ryan Rubrick, I mean, talks on a stick, look what he creates. Fun to watch. Zada, I mean, the kid, I mean, listen, he's going to, you know, he'll, his goals will come, but he's doing 20 other things right, right? Um, you know, Brady Waz, and look how creative he is. Look at the things, you know, he does in the pucks on his stick. Um, you know, uh, Kevin, obviously, you know, guys we traded for, Jack Brody. Look how good he's turned out. Jack's another guy I coached with Kevin growing up, right? Entertaining, you know, gritty, tenacious, right? Offensive. So I think Max Crete, you know, he's another steal in the draft, right? He, he was there. And he was like a Kevin Heater. He was, you know, there at that second round. And we're like, you know, oh, my God, he's here. We got to take him, right? So, I think there's that hunger and that willingness and that energy and excitement, and that's the talk about this team. It's exciting, right? And it's young and it's youthful. And, I mean, you know, as we grow and mature, we're going to be tough to stop, right? And as we add pieces in, Matthew Humphreys, he's a good young goaltender. He's got a lot of size to him. You know, goalies develop at different ages, but he's done the pipeline. You know, he come in next year and show himself. And even our depth guys, our guys who are, aren't in the lineup, you know, in and out, Tallis or Diana, guys like that, you know, they're going to have their opportunity, right? So we've now provided, you know, a little bit of everything with depth, you know, to create a proper team going forward, right? And I think the future is very, very brightful here, and people can see it, and we're hearing it, and we're seeing it. Yeah, and building through the draft, I think, is definitely key when you are in that part of your cycle where you're able to go and make those big moves for those big players. The development in the draft, I think, is, is the most important thing. And you talk about guys like Max Creed and Ethan Zada really showing that uh, you know they have that tenacious attitude and and really the type of player that Ben Boudreau wants uh, wants to play. You obviously have the top end skilled guys like the Ryan Rubrics and the Brady Waslins, but you need some of those guys like to find like Max Creed and Ethan Zadas to be able to and even even Ivan Galianov like the. Way way that those guys play to be hard to play against you know the guys that go in and get the puck they're they're responsible 200 foot players like when you're looking at at a guy's skill set and you've already got so many high-end skilled players like that and you're looking at other other avenues like what are you looking at when you find a max crete you find an ethan zada you find an ivan galianov like what are you really looking for in those guys well even ivan right i didn't mention him before i don't know you did but he's he was a steal i, I, I had him second round on my list and i was like Late first, and how do we have in the fourth round? I remember, I mean, I told you that story, right? And that's tons of energy, you know, something that somebody always sees something different in. You know, listen, I coach, I played, you know, I, you know, I get to know these kids, know their families, and people talk a lot about players, right? And, you know, these are kids who drop in, someone could say one or two things about their game or who they are or this and that. You know, I really look at the player and the person itself and their value, and I'm like, opportunities always have to have to be given, you know, and there's a reason these guys fall to where we are, right? So, you know, if you really look at this, you know, you had a Kevin He, Max Crete, Ivan Galianov. These are three players who were probably rated a little higher, and they went a little lower, and not too, right? And we, we got them. We took that opportunity and those chances in them, right? And look, we're now building a team with them. So I think that's one thing. Max is the same way. You know, he was probably overlooked as a size. But I'm like, this guy's got a heart of a lion. He's in great shape. 
you know, you watch a fight the other day. He's like, what are you, five, seven, five, eight? I mean, he, that was amazing, right, on Thursday night. Like, you know, he's so tough. He, he's so skilled, and now he's making a name for himself, right? But he got overpassed because of one, I would say, quality. And we're like, we're not, we're not looking at that. We're going to give this kid an opportunity. We know where he fits here, and we, you know, he's made the most of it since he came here. And last question for you, Adam, before we uh, before we let you go, and we appreciate uh, you giving your time today. Lastly, about Ethan Zada, because obviously he's on the central scouting list at the the first initial list came out. He's projected to be a sixth, seventh round pick. From what we've seen from the progression of Ethan Zada, we see the point total that is, has really gone up, and we've seen him become more of an offensive player. We knew that he was always there as a defensive player and, and winning key draws and things like that. By the next time we talk to you, the next scouting list will most likely come out. Um, you know what? Just how high up do you think that Ethan Zada is going to go in that next next list? Because I think he's somebody that a guy uh, he's turning a lot of heads right now uh, around uh, you know the scouting community and things like that. He's got twenty points in twenty six games. He only had seventeen all the last year. So um, you know, for somebody that had drafted Ethan Zada or was a part of that, um, just uh, you know, whatever team gets him come next June's draft. Do you think that, uh, you know, wherever he is drafted isn't going to be high enough? So Ethan was a player that I saw when I first started scouting two years ago. I mean, he caught my eye right away. Um, He did everything, like five-tool player. Like, he carried his team to the finals every tournament. And, listen, you know, we we believed him. We took him where we took him for a reason. Um, You know, on Thursday, there was probably 50 NHL scouts at the game in Niagara. And I talked to probably five of them. They all, you know, thought highly of him. They all asked about him. You know, they love this skill set. Like I said, he's a special player. If he's not scoring, he's doing three other things right. And that's what makes him, like, strong, right? He can score, right? I mean, he's coming along now. He sets up plays. I think you're going to see him, the second half will be good for him. And, you know, listen, the team's going to take him, and, and, and they're going to get a great player who's, you know, going to be a you know, potential future NHLer, Right. He's got the size, he's the smart, you know, he's tough, he can score, he makes plays, he's a good teammate, tons of energy. So, you know, these are guys like this that also help us elevate as a team, right? The guys who sort of play all those key roles underneath the Kevins or underneath the Bradys, right? And, you know, we're right beside them, and Ethan's one of those players, right? So he's a huge part of this lineup, and you're going to see good things from down the stretch here, for sure. Absolutely, and we look forward to seeing the progression of Ethan Zada and the rest of these young players that uh, the scouting staff has you know, brought into this organization. Adam Henderson, the Ice Dogs Director of Scouting, here on another What's on the Menu, brought to you by Carmine's Pizzeria Italiano. Adam, thanks so much for taking the time to do this. I know it was a busy weekend, and, and it's a busy time for scouting, so much appreciated. Uh, happy holidays to you and your family, and we look forward to talking to you once again sometime in the new year. Thanks, Brandon. There was Ice Dogs Director of Scouting, Adam Henrich. Cam, I know we only got a few minutes here, but uh, a lot of great stuff there from from Adam Henrich talking about the you know the development of Ethan Zada and why he thinks he's going to be a strong guy for the upcoming NHL draft. Talked about Max Creed and just you know taking us in depth of, of why they select certain players and and this very important young core that they're building in Niagara. I want to get your thoughts on it. Well, I, I like the fact that he opened up about the draft process and that. Yeah, like he mentioned, I like this the fact that uh, Kevin he at the combine broke McDavid's fastest skater, like you know was was a, did a faster lap time. That's kind of impressive. But he mentions that he looks at all these tools and things they have, and there's a reason why some players fall. But he is willing. Their their scouting staff is willing to overlook things like Max Crete, obviously not the biggest, and that's kind of like one of the big things that everyone looks for is size. But he's got the heart of a lion, and we have seen that every single game in in the season so far and uh, so i like hearing that uh, you know in those in those kinds of instances and what they're looking for and their willingness to not just go for whatever looks to be the prototype big good player um you've got to take your risks and uh they've done that over the last few years we mentioned galianov falling in the draft so far and you know the ability to grab him so you know uh, zada i agree i think that he is he's definitely going to get drafted and we'll see how high he goes but um, it's just going to be big for the upcoming season. Yeah, great stuff there. And and again, uh, we look forward to chatting with him sometime in the new year when maybe that new scouting list comes out and Ethan Zada uh, gets up that. And we can even ask him a little bit about uh, that upcoming two, uh, 2008, no, 2009 yeah. draft class. Uh, God, these kids are getting drafted uh, 
born in 2009, Cam. It it's makes us feel nuts. makes us feel really old. Uh, we were in high school then. But uh, as, as we f- wrap up the episode here, Cam, the Ice Dogs are going to have three home games, seven road games uh, the rest of the month here until we do our next uh, monthly recap. We're still going to do the three game recaps for the home games, but that's a possible 20 points that the Ice Dogs can earn up until the beginning of January, and then they'll play you know a couple of games, the three games there before the uh, the OHL trade deadline. So. Uh, when we come back here after Christmas on uh, on this portion of it anyway, 20 points. What are you hoping to see from the Ice Dogs here? 500. Again, I don't want to see the losing streak continue, and I think 500 is just a you know, fair record for them. I think it's kind of expectations. And to be honest, even if they just go 500 the rest of the year, with given how good their start was, you know, I, I, my expectations after the first month that were just sky high because of that first month, a little bit unfair. The fact that, you know, they were doing so well, I don't, I, I would just like to see them finish fourth. I don't want to see them get to, you know, March and, and, you know, we're close to like, we're in that six, seven, eight range. You know, I, I don't want to see that. I want them to, you know, continue to grow and battle through the tough times in the season and get everyone healthy and, and really prepare for that first round. Yeah. And we look at it like last thoughts here, the ice dogs with, with, with you look at, look at it. They're third in goals, four in the conference, but they're second behind Peterborough, only by only two goals uh, for the most goals given up in the league. So they score a lot, but they also give up a lot. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they've got to get those, those goals against down because we've heard Ben Boudreaux talk about in the post games that when they lose, they tend to lose big uh, other than when they take the games to overtime and things like that. And when they when they win, they don't give up a lot of goals. So I think that's basically shows you right there that when they're not playing that structured team defense and they're not all buying in. Um, we've seen that they can they can get off the rails, and when they do, they could be one of the top teams in all the Ontario Hockey League. So I think finding that balance, not having so many peaks and valleys this month uh, that we've seen uh, in November, I think that's one thing they're going to hone in and work on here. Definitely uh, extremely important. Again, I think that they were in kind of the longer month of the season. We've got a crazy road trip. And uh, them just being able to to keep their head above water, I think, is going to be key. I think that the, you know that if the if everything falls off the rails there and they're on the road for eight eight or seven straight games, like it's just it's very tough to come back from that because then you get a break away from the team. I think that everything's lined up really well. They can really do some team bonding, uh, have a successful road trip, you know, and then they get that break, you know. Um, and, and you know, there's a lot left of the season, but there's been so many good stories so far, and and that's uh, you know something to be proud of. Well, Cam, thanks for doing this. Always enjoy coming on for a monthly recap so everybody can see our our beautiful uh, faces on the video version. Mm -hmm. But we'll continue to do our our game recaps, but it's fun to come on here and get the segments and uh, just talk a little bit more in depth than we we do maybe on the game recaps. 100%. Always a blast talking to you guys. And uh, got a couple more game recaps before they head out on the road. Absolutely. Thank you to everybody that tuned in today on the YouTube version on our YouTube channel. Make sure to hit like, hit subscribe, and smash that bell. And thank you to those who listened on your favorite on-demand audio platform. So for Cam Halbert, my name is Brandon Caputo. That's another edition of the Dog Pound Podcast, the official podcast of your Niagara Ice Dogs, proudly brought to you by Global Pet Foods, where pets are undeniably part of the family right here on the Armchair GM Sports Network. We'll talk to you again on our next monthly recap for the beginning of 2025. Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and we'll talk to you again very soon. You're listening to the Armchair GM GM Sports Network.